Okay, you're ready to go. All right, so welcome everybody to our first invited talk. I mentioned at the beginning of the conference that um, one of the themes, the theme this uh, year was um, quantum, post-quantum uh, cryptography and cryptanalysis, given these uh, efforts in standardizing post-quantum cryptography. And then we couldn't think of a better candidate to give a talk as an ex speaker who obtained his PhD at the ENS in Paris and the topic of lattice based crypto, did a postdoc at UCSD and then joined CWI in Amsterdam. And I have an ambulance going by. Sorry about that. Where he's now a uh, work is now tenured. So his uh, research is in uh, cryptology, uh, lattices, algorithms, and cryptanalysis, and he has substantially contributed to quantum cryptanalysis of uh, lattice-based schemes. And in particular, he's a co-designer of several candidate schemes to the NIST post-quantum standardization effort that I just mentioned. Okay, so uh, please join me in welcoming Leo Tukas. Uh, we'll, we'll, allow you, we'll allow you the round of applause for uh, for our next time. <laughs> uh, let me share my desktop. Here we are. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your introduction and uh, especially for your invitation. So uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be your invited speaker. I, I just now realized that I may not have prepared a talk on the topic uh, that you were expecting. Uh, because I'm, I'm going to talk about lattices and factoring, but not particularly post-quantum uh, cryptography candidates. Uh, I hope uh, you will forgive me for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I today I wanted to, to uh, use this invited talk to revisit uh, uh, old ideas, uh, because I think they're nice and uh, they've, they've been... Uh, uh, a little bit in the air, if even maybe in the news lately, with uh, uh, the publication of Schnorr of a paper on uh, on ePrint, uh, and those those are reminiscent of ideas that are from 40 years ago. And uh, and the reason I wanted to talk about all this is because I think that uh, cryptography is is getting old. I'm sorry to say so, or maybe I could could say it, uh, if we compare it to mathematics, maybe we could say that cryptography has reached a, a non-negligible age. And, uh, and you know, the, the history of cryptography, of modern cryptography, uh, you know, has maybe six or seven academic generation in it. So I think we're reaching a point where we might start losing bits of our scientific history, losing uh, track of, of some ideas that have existed and that could still uh, be useful uh, today. So, um, yeah, I think we should write our history. Of course, we're, we've written a lot about all the great victories of, of cryptography, but there are also all small, small battles that maybe seemed lost at the time. But I, I think they, they deserve to, 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 to stay uh, alive in some sense. And for this, we need to, to revisit them from time to time. Um, another motivation uh, for this talk is uh, because I, I wanted to reinstate a little bit uh, knapsack-based cryptography in particular. So knapsack-based cryptography is like the ancestor of lattice-based cryptography. And as soon as I started my PhD in cryptography, I was like, uh, served this narrative that knapsack-based cryptography was kind of an embarrassment and we, we should forget all about it. And thanks to ITIES, we, we grow uh, beyond this dark age and, uh, and we finally have lattice-based cryptography, which is much better. I don't deny that lattice-based cryptography as we do it today is, is better, is more secure. But at the same time, I don't really subscribe to that narrative. And I mean, one way of phrasing it would be the words of Isaac Newton. Uh, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And while I certainly recognize uh, that ITI is 
uh, a giant of lattice-based cryptography, I, I think we should uh, more often try to uh, view the world that Aitai himself uh, had from his sh shoulders. You know, we, it, this giant should not hide us from, from all the other giants. So let me talk about uh, four giants today. Uh, the first two are uh, Klaus Peter Schnell and Leonard Adelman. And they proposed, I mean, they studied uh, an idea, a very interesting idea, to try to factor uh, large integers uh, using lattice techniques. And by more precisely, by trying to find short vector in, in, in a certain lattice very carefully constructed. And maybe even more forgotten uh, is a crypto system of Benny Shore and Ron Rivers, which, uh, as, as I will show, work um, under the dual ID. And this time we're going to do lattice stuff by means of factorizations. More precisely, we're going to solve decoding problems in lattices uh, by, by factoring integer or by factoring polynomials. And so I, I thought that all those ideas would, would fit very well together and they're, they're all from basically the same time frame by the end of the 80s and beginning of the, of the 90s. Uh, so there will be three parts to my talk. The, the first part about factoring with lattices, the second part about decoding with factorization. And, you know, because all of this uh, historical review is, is, is still driven by a purpose, there will be a, a third part where I conclude with some critique of uh, lattice-based cryptography as it is today. Um, so let me let me get started with uh, the first part. So factoring with uh, the lattice short vectors. Um, give me a second to set my timer because I forgot to set it. Okay. Um, so how how does factoring work? Before I show you uh, the strategy of uh, of Schnorr for for factoring, I should first explain you the let's say the standard strategy, not the most advanced algorithms, but at least the basic uh, algorithm for factoring how they work. Uh, so I will present you more specifically the quadratic sieve. So in the in this part, we'll be trying to factor this large number n. And I'm going to use the equal with a triple bar for, for congruence modulo n. And to, to factor it, we're going to try to find a non-trivial solution to this equation, x squared congruent to y squared modulo n. So why is this helpful? Well, because I can factor this equation into the following form, x minus y times x plus y congruent to 0. And is, if those two factors are, are non-trivial, uh, meaning that x are, is different from y or minus y modulo n, then actually I can deduce a factor, a factorization of n out of this, uh, of, out of the factorization of this equation. So now the question is, how do we construct this x and this y? And it's going to be a two-step process. The first one is called relation collection. So if you, if you read Schnorr paper, it speaks of factoring relations. So this, is, this, this technique is trying to improve the, the first step, in some sense, of the quadratic sieve. And then there is some linear algebra step. So quickly, the first step, relation collection. So relations. Uh, are going to be uh, given over what is called the factor basis. So that is just the set of all the primes below a certain bound B. And the, fact, the collection uh, loop goes as follows. We are going to repeat the following step. We're going to take a random X and compute its square, uh, which we are going to reduce modulo N. And this, uh, this square, uh, this Z modulo N, uh, I'm going to view it as an integer again, uh, and I'm going to try to factor it over the factor basis. So here at this point, you might have the feeling that I'm just reducing the factorization to another factorization for that. And this is the case. 
But the thing is that I've introduced randomness in between. So it might be that Z is actually easier to factor than the original number. And this is exactly what I'm hoping for because I'm hoping that this Z factor just using those small primes. Uh, the second thing is if it doesn't, I can just retry with another X and, uh, and, and try another one. So if I manage to, to write the Z as a product of small primes, which I can try to do by simply doing trial division, just trying repeat the, successively all the primes in my factor basis. If I success in doing so, I'm just gonna write down this relation that X squared is congruent to a product of primes with certain exponents. Uh, and I'm going to repeat this. I don't need just one relation. I need many relations about B of them. And so somehow the complexity is going to be dictated by this uh, number B that needs to be carefully chosen. So if I increase B, I improve the success probability of each trial division. But at the same time, I'm increase the cost of each of those trial divisions because I have more primes to test, and I also need to find more relations. So I'm not going to go, going to go into the detail of the complexity analysis, but it turns out that because of the density of smooth number, the optimal uh, smoothness bound B to choose is this sub-exponential function of the bit size of the prime I want to factor. So exponential of roughly square root of log n which is sometimes written uh, as this uh, L of one half uh, function. Okay, so this is the relation collection step. And what do I do with those relations? Well, I'm just gonna write them uh, here on top of each other. So I have a bunch of squares on the left hand side and on the right hand side of products of primes. And basically I want to end up with something where both the left hand side and the right hand sides are squares of numbers that I know. So I basically want to combine all those equations, uh, take a multiplicative combination of those equations, such that all the exponent on the right hand side becomes uh, even integers. And this is something that is easily done because I can just write all my exponent in, in a big matrix and solve a linear system modulo two. And that's going to give me, uh, how, that's gonna tell me how I should be combining those equations so that all the right hand side are even. And if all the right hand side are even, then I have effectively written uh, congruence between two squares. I have x squared congruent to y squared modulo n, and I have found some non-trivial factor of n. Okay, so now uh, I, I gave you the most naive version of this algorithm. And in this very naive version, we were choosing our x's at random, meaning that x squared modulo n would be a random number modulo n. So essentially, x would be uh, x squared mod n would be essentially as large as n. And we cannot help but notice that if this number would be smaller, then the success probability of trial division should be larger, right? It's it's easier to factor small numbers and large ones. So can we try to aim and make x squared mod n smaller? Well, there is a very easy way to do this. So uh, n is not a square, so its square root is not an integer, but I can just take a x that is close, an integer x that is close to square of n. And if I do this, I'm going to have that x square itself is close to n. Meaning that if I reduce x square modulo n, I'm going to get something significantly smaller than n. Uh, I, so I cannot only take the closest rounding of uh, square root of n to an integer. I need a, a larger range because I need to try many times to, to find uh, factor in relations. But essentially, I can still get something that is significantly smaller than, uh, than n. And overall, this gives you a complexity gain. But unfortunately, because I've hidden so many things inside uh, inside the, the constant in the exponent, I'm not able to show the explicit gain, but essentially it improves significantly the, the complexity of the algorithm by uh, 
decreasing the, the, the hidden constant in this sub-exponential complexity. So we see that you know, carefully choosing uh, um, our left-hand side gives us the opportunity to improve the success probability of the right-hand side being easy to factor. So can we do more? Can we do something you know, a bit uh, more evolved than just you know, choosing x close to square root of n? And this is precisely what Schnorr was trying to do already in 1991. So first, I need to explain a small relaxation to, to allow for, for this new strategy is to note that we actually don't really need the left-hand side to be a square. If we also choose the right-hand side to be something that I can factor over the small primes, so, so something that is B smooth, I can, you know, after the fact, I can move my left-hand side to the right-hand side, and then I end up with an equation of one being congruent to, again, a product of primes. And the left-hand side is one, so it is a square. So this thing is an equally valid relation for trying to, for, for the second step of uh, the, the quadratic sieve. Okay, so now that we've given this different uh, way, this more, this larger degrees of freedom to, to, to try to hit something that is close to n, uh, we, we can just do this. We can just try to find integer positive exponents such as you know, the product of uh, the smallest primes raised to the exponent, this is approximately equal to n. And what is this problem? Well, this problem is just a knapsack problem or an approximate knapsack problem, right? Because I want to find positive integers. Well, maybe they can be greater than one, so it's not exactly a knapsack, but um, I want to find positive integers such that this equation approximately old. I want to hit something that is close to log n using integer combination of log of p1, log of p2, log of p3, etc. Okay. So what is the first thing you do when you encounter a knapsack? Or even worse, an approximation of a knapsack? Well, you write it as a lattice problem, more specifically, you close uh, vector problem. And so here, the typical way of constructing the associated lattice is as follow. You, uh, and let's, let's focus on the last row of this matrix first. So this last row encodes specific, specifically the uh, equation we had on the previous slide here. Okay, so this equation, you find it here. But you also are keeping more information in your lattice with those diagonal coefficients. Why do you have to do this? Well, it's because knapsacks and CVP are different things. When you're solving a knapsack, you're asking for a zero one solution, or at least in this case, something where all the coefficients are positive. Whereas in lattices, you don't have this kind of constraint. If you find a short vector lattice, Nothing tells you that uh, this solution here, EI, et cetera, is going to be positive. You would only have the constraint that it is integer. So fortunately, uh, this uh, having negative exponent is not a direct killer. The reason is that actually there's a bit more freedom in the solution that I want to find. And if instead of finding an integer as uh, my approximate solution, uh, for the product of primes. So now I have primes on top and primes on, on uh, under the fraction. And this is approximately equal to n. Then I can also get that u is approximately equal to vn. So this quantity s equal u minus vn or just u modulo n, this might still be small. But by using this implication here, I'm, what I'm hiding is that this implication degrades the quality of the approximation, okay? This, this uh, as V gets larger, this, this implication will be looser and looser in some sense. So not only do I want to control how well the, the sum, the integer sum of those logs is going to be close to log of N, I also want to control how large these integers themselves are going to be or at least the, the, what is below on this fraction. And this is why I have those diagonal coefficients here. 
So, yeah, so what can we do with this? Actually, I've been attempting at several occasions and I've been discussing with other people uh, how to, to do average case analysis of, of this, uh, this algorithm. And it, it turns out to be particularly painful. Um, my laptop is complaining about battery. I'm going to have to take a one minute pause. Uh, should have thought of that before the talk. Okay, um, so it is it is particularly daunting to do an, an average case analysis of this algorithm because there are so many pitfalls. So the first one is that you know when you do your CVP, you're not in a full dimensional lattice, so you need to apply due projections, but that's manageable. The second one, and this is the one that is much more troublesome, is that actually for certain values of this constant that was hidden in this lattice. The Gaussian heuristic seems actually invalid. And even worse, it seems that the optimal choice of this constant is in this regime for all the experiments that I was able to run. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a magic one to, to, to predict uh, lattice, be lattice uh, behavior and lattice algorithm. So if it's not applicable to this lattice, then, then you're in trouble. Um, the uh, one more trouble is that you typically solve a shortest vector problem for the L2 norm, but it turns out that the L2 norm is not going to tell you precisely how large this number S is going to be, and this is what you want to control. The L1 norm is more relevant, but again, the natural way of trying to translate L2 norm into L1 norm seems to also be uh, a, a non-viable heuristics in certain regimes. So for now, uh, we have all those troubles just with lattices. There is some extra trouble uh, if you try to analyze this, is that once you've constructed this uh, number S that you want to, to, to apply trial division to, this number does not behave like a random number with respect to trial division. The reason is that in UNV, I'm using all those small primes. And if I use those primes for U or for V, actually this prime is not av available for dividing S anymore. So it means that the success probability of trial division is going to be worse for S's that I've constructed in this way than it is for random S's. So if you want to study this, this topic a little bit more, you have to also be careful that uh, you see several kinds of variants in, in the papers, like sometimes the, the primes that you use to construct the left-hand side are exactly the same as the, the one that you're trying to factor. Uh, but here, I think considering the unconstrained case is nicer because it gives you all the range of trade-offs and makes a natural way of comparing to the quadratic set. So what I only have to offer for now um, is, uh, is uh, experimental result. So I should clarify that this is uh, also a, a different thing that what I have uh, published on GitHub uh, regarding the latest version of Schnorr claims here. I'm, I'm like, I'm considering a, a, an older version of this algorithm that I think makes more sense and uh, in a more general, uh, you know, more unconstrained setup. And I, as I was explaining, the, the size of S is not the only concern, but it is like the main concern in the complexity analysis. And in particular, if we want to beat the quadratic sieve, we have to be able to construct S's that are smaller than the quadratic sieve. And the quadratic sieve, we could construct S's that were roughly square of N. So that's why I have like this quadratic sieve baseline at, uh, at one half on this plot. And I'm uh, plotting against this, the size of the S that are constructed using uh, the approach of Schnorr. And so the way to read this plot is that if you want to factor 100 bits uh, integer n, for example, so to the green curve, then to beat the quadratic sieve at the non-lattice steps, so at the final steps of the algorithm, then I'm going to need you know, a dimension that is larger than 50 because it's barely crossing a dimension 50. But that might not be sufficient for two reasons. The first one is that then I also need to account for the cost of the lattice steps. And secondly, you know, the, the, the probability that uh, my S is actually easy to factor can be actually smaller than, uh, 
than for uh, the quadratic sieve, even if they have the same size. And if you look at the curve for larger uh, challenges that are easy to solve with, with standard algorithms, it seems the moment that we're going to need lattices of unreasonable dimensions. But I wouldn't dare to make a prediction uh, for now uh, without, uh, you know, without having more formal argument for, for the asymptotic behavior. Um, so I shared all this because, well, I, I, despite the fact that it doesn't seem to work, I think this is a deep and brilliant idea. Mathematically, it's, it's, it's just very nice. It's a beautiful insight. And even if it doesn't work, I think it is a shame that we still won't have a complexity analysis, uh, a solid complexity analysis of this, uh, even 40 years after the idea was laid out. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like a positivity bias. It, it's, it's tough to write about things that don't work. And especially when it is so challenging as, as we've seen, there's like so many pitfalls to avoid. But we should, we should try harder. Um, and the more interesting thing even here is that despite all this not working, it actually led to uh, other application and in particular milestone results in particular by high time. So the story is like this is uh, Adelman uh, picked up this idea of, uh, of Schnorr a few years later, uh, and he was attempting not so much to factor efficiently, but more at proving the hardness of the shortest vector problem. At that time, we didn't really know what, uh, how hard was SVP. And it was even, you know, uh, some people might even easily think that SVP was an easy problem because the lattice that, uh, that we handle at that time, they would all be destroyed by LLL just because you know, computers could not handle more than 50 or 60 dimension and LLL behaves very well in small dimensions. So some people might have thought that SVP was kind of an easy problem. And I don't think that Adelman ever managed to, to, to make this proof work. And I think that Aitai was trying to uh, finalize the work of Adelman when he actually stumbled uh, across a much more powerful result, namely that SVP is not only harder than factoring, but actually it's NP hard. It's factor, it's harder than all the NP problem, at least under randomized reduction. And despite uh, no explicit factorization results in Aitai's work, the same lattice, the same lattice construction is playing a key role in the proof. And I think this is remarkable. Uh, I should also mention that uh, this kind of techniques has, has uh, reappeared later on for different purposes, like constructing extremal examples for the ABC conjecture, but using, you know, again, the same kind of uh, oracle for the closest vector problem, there is also a module LLL algorithm that uh, was put forward by uh, Lee, Pelé, Marie, Stelle, and uh, Wallet uh, two years ago. So before I move to, to the second part of my talk, I, I just want to say a few words about uh, Aitai's result and Aitai's technique. Uh, if you remember a few slides ago, I mentioned there was kind of a gap between knapsack and lattice problems. In particular, knapsack solution, they should be binary, whereas SVP solutions are just arbitrary integers. And this, this, this was a significant gap because at the time knapsack was known to be NP hard, but not the shortest vector problem. And the key insight that, uh, that makes Aitai's proof work is that the zero one solution in Schnorr Adelman lattices are precisely in correspondence with integers that are smooth and square free and, and that live in, a, in an interval of a, of a specific size. And the thing is that uh, we know how to count those. We know how to count those from analytic number theory. This is something we've studied very deeply, is precisely for, for factoring uh, or for understanding you know, arithmetic properties of, of random numbers. So despite factoring not being the goal anymore, those, those ideas still play a key role. And he was basically able to embed like uh, this constraints that things should be zero one into uh, 
into into a lattice problem so that it could reduce uh, knapsack and, and SVP. So it showed that SVP was harder than knapsack, and therefore that SVP was NP hard. So I don't master this proof fully, and I it's not uh, my purpose to go over it today. But uh, I'm hoping that uh, Daniele will give a talk next week at the risk seminar. So if you want to learn more about ITI's proof of NP hardness, you can maybe join uh, this seminar next week. Okay, so that that was uh, that was it for for uh, for factoring using lattices. Now let's do um, let's do it the other way around. We are going to try to uh, solve lattice problem using uh, ideas of factorization. Um, so what we want precisely in this section is to construct a lattice which is a good packing, it's a dense lattice. So, uh, but we also, so that's the mathematical problem of sphere packing, but we also want it to come with an efficient decoding algorithm because if this is the case, then we can use it for error correction, for example, over analog channels. So because it's a bit simpler uh, for, for my slides, I'm going to focus on the L1 norm for my errors, but all this can be adjusted to the L2 norm as well. Um, so the bounded distance decoding problem is as follow. I received uh, I receive a, a point in space T that I, uh, is by promise the sum of a lattice vector, which corresponds maybe to the discrete message that I want to send, and an error E, which is kind of a continuous error that is added by the channel. And the goal of decoding is to separate somehow this message and this error. And of course, for the solution to be unique, this is only possible if my uh, error radius is less than the half of the minimal distance of the lattice. So how large of an R can we hope to solve? Uh, or how large of a minimal distance can we hope to have? This is given by Minkowski bound. Minkowski tells you for the L1 norm, so this is not the L2 Minkowski, but the L1 Minkowski, that the minimal distance, once you normalize it by the root determinant of the lattice, is at most uh, linear in the dimension. If you take the trivial lattice Zn, the square lattice, then this quantity is just one. And I would like, I would like it to be as large as big O of n for uh, better decoding. Uh, uh, um, uh, properties. So we want a lattice that reach close to this bound, but where we also have an algorithm for decoding close to this bound. And actually, uh, if you look at the short rhythm script of system, there is there no way there is in no way talking about decoding in some sense. They're only talking about cryptography. So. Actually, Core and Rivers proposed a, a public key crypto system, public key encryption scheme that you can summarize like this. Uh, the idea is that the subsystem problem, problem is seemingly a hard problem, or a knapsack is a hard problem, but the subset product is easy. That is by subset product or multiplicative knapsack. I mean that if you know all the primes that are supposed to, that may appear in something, then you can do the factorization, you can do the decomposition, you just do trial division with all the primes that are in your factor basis. So the idea of core and rivers was actually extremely natural. Take logarithms, and this way you will disguise a subset product problem into a subset sum problem. Okay, and as long as this disguise kind of works, as long as it's not too visible that you've done this, then maybe you have a, 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 a trapdoor here, maybe you have a public key cryptography. So there are like several variants of this. In particular, the original variant of the scheme was uh, doing this over uh, polynomials, over finite fields. But here I'm more going to talk about versions of the integers because I think it's it's easier for, for exposition. And my whole point is that inside this crypto system, there's actually a beautiful coding gem. Uh, for example, in one of those variants, uh, uh, Briere et al. show that if you remove the cryptography out of it, then you end up with a pretty good binary code that decodes with a, a really large, with a good radius efficiently. 
And with Cecil Pierrot, three years ago, we've done essentially the same thing for the core rivers lattice. And we show that it actually is this construction, this beautiful construction actually hides an excellent uh, lattice for bounded distance decoding. So how does the construction work? So, well, again, um, we're going to have a factor basis. This first modulus, uh, an integer modulus, which I'm going to choose for as a power of three. Because if I take it as a power of two, then the multiplicative group is not cyclic and it's not really a problem. It just makes my life uh, a bit more painful. So, uh, and to, with this, I take the usual factor basis. So all the primes smaller than a constant B, except that I'm going to skip three because I want all the things to be uh, co-prime with them. And uh, then I'm going to define a, a morphism. So here, here is my uh, disguising function. Here is, is where I take something additive and map it to something multiplicative. So I take the, uh, the additive group Zn, okay? And I map it to the multiplicative group Z over Mz simply by sending each integer vector x to the product of Px, uh, Pi to the Xi. It's kind of like taking the exponent of a vector, even a, a vector as the basis. And I take all this modulo by modulus m. And now you can define a lattice simply by taking the kernel of this map. OK, so I'm going to have a lattice be defined as a set of all the vector v's, such that this product with exponent vi's is congruent to one mod m. And you know, if you're doing lattice-based cryptography and you're, you're not so much number theory or, or or algebra, this might be a very strange way of defining a lattice. But uh, it is it is not so strange if uh, if you suddenly decide to rewrite it additively simply by taking discrete logarithms, right? So before we constructed something with primes and, and logarithms, here we do the same, except that we take discrete logarithms. And, and this is where my modulus was kind of important because I've taken uh, my modulus to be a power of three or a power of a small prime. Actually, the discrete logarithm is going to be uh, easy. It's going to be polynomial time. All you have to do is do it modulo three and then do uh, like Hansel lifting kind of uh, business. And if you do so, then you can rewrite this, you know, multiplicatively written lattice into an additive one. So it's, it becomes kind of a, a subset sum kind of lattice where the lattice is defined by a linear equation modulo uh, phi of m. Okay, so that's the sum of the VI times the discrete logarithms of the PI congruent to zero mod phi of n. Okay, so how good of a lattice it is? Why is it a good lattice? Let's not even talk about decoding yet. Why is this lattice a dense, uh, a dense lattice? Why is it a good packing? So we know pretty easily its dimension and its determinant. And all we have to, to really work a little bit for, for getting is the minimal distance of this lattice, okay? And here I'm going to claim that this uh, minimal distance is actually lower bounded by log of m over log of b. This is a convenient lie. Um, actually, you might lose a, a factor two if you do the real proof instead of the cheating proof. But let's go with the cheating proof. Um, so um, I, I recall that the lattice, when I write it multiplicatively, it's just a product of the PIVIs congruent to one mod n. So if I want a vector in that lattice to be non-zero, it means that when I take this product, this must wrap around modulo m. Otherwise, this product over the integer will be smaller than m, and there is no way that it's congruent to one mod m. Right? So in particular, if I take the largest of those primes raised to the length of the vector in L1 norm, this has to be larger than m, and this gives our claim just by taking logarithms. So this is a bogus proof. Why is it a bogus proof? Because I've completely ignored negative uh, coefficients in the exponents. But if you work a little bit more, you can adjust this proof and adjust the claim to also handle negative exponents. 
Um, and now you just have to instantiate the, the lattice asymptotically, so n, n grows. And, uh, and I'm just basically a simple instantiation taking this uh, integer k, uh, so the, the power that appears in the modulus to be essentially equal to n or just proportional to m is going to lead to the desired result that uh, the minimal distance of the lattice is actually very good. It's n over log n, which is only a log n factor away from the give out. So before this, the, the best lattices we knew how to decode was in uh, fourth root of n. So only halfway between the trivial case and Minkowski bound. So this gets us much closer to Minkowski bound. Of course, we know better lattices. We know lattices with uh, you know, uh, this minimal distance being big O of n, but those lattices we don't know how to decode. And this lattice, I claim that we know how to decode it. And this is uh, again uh, given by uh, core and reversed uh, crypto system. Precisely the, this, the decryption algorithm is if you remove the crypto out of it, it's just a decoding algorithm. So, how does this decoding algorithm work? I remind you of the notation. So, we want to decode up to a radius of log of m over log of b. Um, and we have a target here that writes as a lattice vector plus some error, and we want to separate the error and the, and the, and the lattice vector. And again, I'm going to abuse the multiplicative way of writing my lattice in some sense. So I'm going to compute this quantity f to be the product of the pi raised to those uh, ti's, which are my targets. Um, and then I'm going to compute, uh, I, I, if, I, if I unroll this definition of ti, I just get this double product, product of pi vi's and pi ei's. Okay, and this by the very construction of my lattice, okay, this quantity is always one modulo m. Okay, so what we are left is this with this quantity, product of the pi ei modulo m. But the thing is, because those exponents are small enough by assumption, right? Because this error is small, I actually know that this is, sorry, this shouldn't be Q here, this should be M. I know that this product is smaller than the modulus, okay? And because it is smaller than the modulus, it means that I have it recovered it over the integers and not just modulo M. So now it is very easy to, to factor it, okay? It's, it's a sub, sub, subset product problem. I can just do trial division and recover the exponents. And then if I recover the exponent, as give simple subtraction will also give me the lattice vector. This is, this is actually a very simple decoding algorithm. And so again, I've cheated a little bit because I've only decoded positive error. Uh, it turns out that if you do a bit more effort, you can also decode uh, errors that might have negative components. And you do this by computing the same quantity f, but in your mind, you split it as the part with positive exponent and the part with negative exponent. And then you're, you know, in your mind, there's a u and a v that you should be recovering, but you also know that those two guys should be small. So this is kind of a rational like, construction problem. I know fraction, I know that two things are small and I know it mod n and I need to recover uh, both things. And this is something you can solve with, with a simple uh, shortest vector problem, but this time in the lattice of dimension two. So there's no, there's no hardness here. This is, uh, this is trivially polynomial time. Again, I've not completely fully solved the whole problem of decoding because still my errors here are integers, but it turns out that with those parametrization, just rounding the target T before doing all this will actually give you uh, still the same quality of decoding, even if you have continuous error, maybe up to a small constant factor to choose. So, uh, it is very nice. It is. It was in uh, 2018, as far as I know, the best uh, decoding radius that was achievable uh, when comparing it to Minkowski bound. Uh, just a log n away from it, but it's still a bit away from it. So can can we do better? And if you look at what's going on, what's costing you this log n factor, it seems is the fact that if you want n primes, and one of them has to be you know larger than n. 
you would like to have more small primes. You would like all your primes to be two or something. And if, if, if you had like so many primes of this size, then you would kill the log n. So you can try to do this with other, uh, with other rings. So switching back from the integers maybe to, to polynomials over fp, but it doesn't seem to improve the asymptotics. And actually, when I show this to people uh, more inclined to elliptic curves than I, they say, yeah, maybe this is something you can solve with elliptic curves. And obviously, I'm not the guy for, for this. So, so I'm turning back the problem to, to you guys. Uh, is this elliptic curve uh, going to solve this? Do we have enough primes uh, to, to solve this? And also, if, you, if you're bringing lattices and elliptic curves together, you have to mention the, the modern veil lattices, which are also extremely fancy lattices uh, that reach Minkowski bounds and that are built out of, uh, of the elliptic curves. So um, please don't ask any question of those two, on those two things. Uh, those questions are for you as a suggestion of open problems, but I'm really, really not uh, equipped to, to answer anything about it. Um, but what I should mention as well is that there is actually a recent result that's outperformed uh, uh, what we've analyzed with Cecil Pierrot, uh, which actually use a completely different approach. Again, it's a fancy construction of a lattice, it's construction D, and it's also using some uh, coding theory. So I think there are some BCH codes uh, behind uh, this construction. And using this uh, MOOC and PyCurt, we're actually able to give a decoding algorithm that is only a square root log n away from uh, Minkowski bounds. And they can even do more. I think they can do like this decoding and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice. So why all this? What is my point with all this? Why, why should cryptographers should care about all this? So the first thing I want to say is that, you know, not all knapsack-based cryptography is actually broken. Actually, the core of the crypto system is not broken, at least in the asymptotic sense. And, uh, and it offers actually very short ciphertext. Of course, it has rather large public keys, but it offers much shorter ciphertext than LDB can offer, I think. At least if you, you know, you have to, to readjust to the state of the art with lattice algorithm because it is from 40 years ago, because they were targeting like 80 or even less bits of security. So to, to reparameterize it. But still, it's because of its excellent uh, decoding capability, it offers very short ciphertext. I also think it's, it's an intriguing problem, from, uh, especially from a quantum point of view, because it's some kind of a reverse of the discrete logarithm problem. The discrete logarithm problem, you're given a field or the representation of a field, and you have to compute discrete logarithm. Here, it's the opposite. You're given discrete logarithms, and you have to recover the representation of, of the field out of it. I have no idea if this is quantum resistant, and I think this is kind of a neat question. Um, I also want to point out that this, this uh, decoding algorithm, you don't have to use it like inside directly the crypto system. You don't have to tie the crypto system to, to it. You could maybe use it inside a pure LWD based scheme. You could like separate the decoding phase from the crypto system itself and maybe improve, uh, improve uh, L schemes that are truly based on LWE despite using those ideas of core and reverse. And it's not only about improving things that exist, it's also about inventing things that did not necessarily exist. In particular, Galbraith and Lee, out of those ideas, actually built something very different from encryption, namely an obfuscator, an obfuscator for near equality that uh, seemingly achieve VBB security. So yes, there is ways of doing uh, new and brilliant stuff out of very old ideas. Which leads me to my little critique of uh, the current state of research in lattice-based cryptography. And I think it can be summarized as this. I think we live in a monoculture centered around the SIS problem and the LW problem, or more technically around random query lattices. And I certainly don't want, this is certainly not a critique of the contribution that have been made, uh, but more of what we've done with all this as a community. And uh, I think the SIS and LWE have like 
made things incredibly easy to build extremely tall uh, uh, tower of, uh, of cryptography, extremely complex and very rich. Uh, but only in the, in, the, in the vertical direction in some sense. And, and the foundational work that has been done was extremely thorough. So this is, this is extremely solid. And it, but it's kind of a comfort zone, and it's it's normal that when we want to build height stuff, you, you do it on the comfort zone. But it doesn't mean that we should be restricted to this comfort zone. And uh, despite SIS and L3 having ex achieved incredible feats, I, I, I think there there's some points to be made about it. The first one is that worst case hardness is something comforting, but it's not a silver bullet. Okay, you you maybe be less afraid of like. Uh, something coming out of like specific instances, but it does not dispense you from cryptanalysis, neither concrete, neither as an asymptotic, neither as a quantum or anything. So worst case, highness is still business as usual. You still have to, to try to break things until you get convinced that it cannot be broken. But as I mentioned, we're, we locked ourselves in a, in a subspace of design, in this comfort zone, uh, where we think that everything is secure, uh, but, you know, maybe they're, they, Maybe this means that the current design are, are far from optimal because we've not explored the full space of things. Um, and this is not necessarily a, an, in, uh, an incitation to uh, throw everything away and jump to different things, but at least we should explore them and document them. And, and it's even worse than this because of this narrative that's, that all this was, uh, was bad crypto and we should forget about it. I think very interesting ideas have been buried, if not even demoted to cryptographic scenes. We've, you know, we've locked ourselves in, 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 uh, in a subset. And why is it problematic? Well, because, you know, in some sense, of, uh, in, in this huge diversity of lattices that exist, it seems that the only thing that we're doing things with uh, algorithmically is the lattice ZN, which is the saddest of all the lattices. Uh, in, indeed, each time you have to do something algorithmically with a lattice, what people do is to reduce themselves to Z or ZN just by, by construction. Geometrically, this is the worst thing that you can do. ZN is the worst lattice. It's, it has the worst packing radius, the worst covering radius, the worst smoothness parameter, it's, it, it just sucks. Where we have like so many more lattices. And the first one that I want to emphasize is, is the root lattices or the root lattice of type A in particular. Why? Because actually they're already there each time you're using a, a cyclotomic rings of prime conductor. It's actually the root lattice is hidden in there. And instead of embracing it and using algorithms that are known for the root lattice, for, for example, the closest vector problem in this lattice, people have been fighting against it. They've been breaking its symmetry. This lattice has been butchered by a generation of cryptanalysts. It's, uh, I don't want to see this happen. It's beautiful lattice. Please don't butcher it. So if you don't want to butcher it, uh, you can read the uh, Bachelor thesis of uh, Vessel van Voorden. But there are just so many more. Uh, Lich lattice, construction D, Barneswell, all those Schnorr, uh, Adelman, Corrivus lattices, or even crazy Moldova lattices. And it's hard to think that they have nothing to offer to cryptography. So uh, we'll conclude with this. Uh, cryptography strives in diversity. And I think that uh, nowadays we would need uh, uh, to be more open in lattice-based cryptography to uh, other backgrounds, other point of view, other goals, and just uh, other people, you know, maybe people that are more coming from coding theory. They've worked on lattices for communication over continuous channels for decades. Uh, maybe people knowing about model reforms, maybe people knowing about discrete uh, symmetric group uh, of like super special lattices, like the monster group over the each lattice. So yeah, I think we need uh, a bit more openness in, in lattice-based cryptography. Doesn't mean that we have to base uh, standard schemes on it, but we should be doing more research in, in, in a wider range of directions. And uh, that is all for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions on uh, Zolib. 
But can you see them or shall I read them? Uh, yeah, I appreciate if you could read them because uh, Zulip is open on the other computer. So it's... Okay. So first question, I think these are questions about the first part. Mm -hmm. First question from Nigel Smart. Why are the diagonal elements in the first lattice equal to log pi and not something like C log pi or something which makes all the diagonal values to be the same size? Okay, so... Oh, ah, he's yes. gone. Yes, uh, so it's basically because um, the, the L1 size of this element, when you put log pi is here, is, uh, is going to be the logarithm of the size of u and of the size of p. So, so essentially by putting those guys here, you, you, you create a relation between the quality of the solution as a lattice vector and um, the, the size of those elements u and v, which are it's themselves going to dictate the size of s. All right. So, and you keep you keep a constant c that you might take want to take large on the last column, so that you can tune whether you want those things to be small or whether you want this approximation to be of high quality. Okay. So this constant c is here uh, is here to tune your two goals, the two things that you want to control, and and find the the right trade off. All right. Thanks. Another question by Daniel Apon. It says, um, Gaussian heuristic seems invalid for certain constant C. We'd like to hear more about this. How, where, why does it fail? Is there a simple punchline about what's going on here? Yeah, so the simple punchline is, again, take this lattice and set C equals zero. And then uh, you, can, uh, you can see that this is not a random lattice at all. Um, Essentially, that's that's almost an orthogonal lattice, and um, <coughs> and uh, yeah, the, the closest vector in an orthogonal lattice is going to be worse than uh, than in a random lattice. Great. Any other questions from the audience that I don't see? I don't see any. So, actually. If I may ask a question, I'm actually curious about this result with relation to obfuscation that you mentioned by Galbraith and Lee. Can you <laughs> elaborate on that a bit? I, I'm, I'm too afraid of uh, saying something stupid, but um, yeah, I think they're encoding things in the exponent and they're, they're using this, this idea that uh, if, if there's not too much error, you can simply recovers those error in the exponent by, by factoring. But uh, honestly, you, you would have to, to talk with Stephen or maybe read their paper to, to know more. So yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I don't have more insight. I just wanted to point at it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I'm a bit short-handed here. Okay, uh, thanks. Any other questions? If not, well, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, wait, there's, there's one more question. Wait, hmm, I posted a question. What would that be? Can you put it? Can you put it on a copy paste? On uh, all right, that's on chat. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go on chat later and try to answer any remaining questions. Well, this will be easy. So for the problem, we're not having enough small primes in uh, Z. Z, the switching to EG a cyclotomic ring, Z, C, Zeta work, or is it nonsense? Sorry? Can you see the chat uh, window? Uh, the, okay. So stop share. Oh, yes, this chat. Uh, for the problem of not having enough small primes in Z, those switching to a say, ah, yes, that's um, that's that's a natural strategy. But then the, the thing is that the notion of size becomes kind of like, it's, it's no more one dimensional thing. So 
I, I, I've tried, but maybe very naively, but I did not manage to, to solve it. But it's, yes, it's, it's somewhere where you have more small primes, so that's, that would be natural as well. All right. Okay, Leo, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, well, thank nice. you again for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. And uh, whilst I'm not sure I'll join the social hours, I, I hope I can. It's a bit late. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Well, we have a, another break now. Uh,